We are recording. Okay, so what we're going to uh, jump into today is um, we're going to do two things. We're going to little look look at um, 3D looping. So um, this is a kind of a natural extension from what we did last week from the 2D loopers into the 3D loopers. So you'll, you won't find it particularly um, much of a jump. It's pretty obvious, you know, where we go. Um, the big difference being, of course, is that um, 3D loopers are really only valuable when we're inside of uh, Artmatic Voyager, uh, whereas the 2D loopers are exclusively a, a designer thing. So you need to have both apps open and running to do this. Uh, and then after that, what I'm going to do is uh, we'll, we'll jump across into um, 3D fractals. Uh, and, and it's not much of a, a jump as it happens. So there's a kind of a fairly reasonable link between these two things because there's a similarity in, in what they do and, and the way that they work. So first of all, um, I've got here, it's a, this is very, again, a very simple, basic uh, Voyager uh, landscape, if you like. I've switched off the planet so we don't have any planet. I've got a clear sky which I've just made into a grey colour so that we can kind of see these things clearly. Uh, and uh, you'll see there's one sphere in this in this window. I'm going to jump across into um, Designer and we're going to have a look at the system that makes this. So one thing you, you have to have, uh, just um, confirm that you have switched on is this little icon here, which gives us the um, communication between designer and Voyager. You'll need to have that on so that you can actually see things updating. Uh, so here's the system. Now, you'll straight away see it's not really that different from what we had last week with the 2D system. So we have a this tile at the top here is just a um, basically just a space um, space organization tile just allows you to have the space organized. You don't have to have that. You could have a three D offset tile. It would be exactly the same um, for for the purposes of this particular um, tutorial. Uh, but that that is something that you'll probably find useful once you start getting into a lot of 3D stuff uh, because it allows you to view the spaces in different ways and it's pretty quick to do that. And two of the ways that you actually view the space in this top one and the Artmatic top view space don't actually change the orientation of the object. All they do is allow the um, designer window to look at it in different ways. So it's quite a useful, useful tile to have there when you're working in 3D. So that's, that's really the only uh, kind of additional thing uh, that we have in the system. So because we're working with a 3D object, we, we have to deal with the color in a, cert, a different way from the 2D object. But let's just forget this side. This is the side that's controlling the color. And you'll know from our uh, recent explorations of, of uh, DF objects, this is how we uh, you know, add color to an object. So just forget about it for the moment because it's not relevant for what we're going to do just with the loopers just yet. <clears throat> On this side, we have exactly the same kind of idea running as we had last time. So we have an object. That's where our, obj oh, whoop, that's where our object is there. That's now a, a DF object rather than just a, you know, my little favorite Gaussian circle. Now we have the ability to pop in pretty much any of the uh, DF objects that we can use here. So we can put in any of these objects as our seed object. Uh, and obviously we can switch to any of the other D um, DF shapes here as well. That's just for a simple object because, you know, again, with, um, with this looping idea, you can loop anything. Um, so you can put other things in there that are not just kind of basic primitives. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, as you start to get more complex uh, descriptions of the distance field in here, the thing that you have happening is gonna be far more complex. So probably don't play with that just yet. Start off with some of the, the simple um, solids uh, so that you can see what's going on. But it's basically the same thing. So here we have, um, a space transformation system. It's actually inside a uh, compiled tree. So if we look inside, you'll see it's just these two tiles. It's very simple. It's only, it's an offset and a rotation. That's all that's there. Then we have our uh, tile that says this is going to be a looping system, an iterat iterative system. Uh, and our object, and then we have to have, as with all uh, looping systems, you have to have a memory tile so that it remembers that you've 
gone through once and then you need to go through again. And the number of times you run through again is controlled in the looping tile by the number of iterations that you choose. Okay, now Steve asked previously if we could have a look at all the settings of tiles when I set these things up. And I said to him that most of the time I'll set these up very, very simply. They're, they're, there's not much variation in anything. They're just the way that you bring these actual uh, components into the system. And I don't, for the purposes of these tutorials, I start with them very, very simple. So there's no, these are nothing in any of these is actually changed except for something in the color tile which we'll talk about in, in a little bit and one other thing uh, which is so th this tile here which is a rotational th three three and three out rotational tile it's all set as just nominal exactly the way it would be if you created it and then the top one here is an offset tile just it's offsets in three dimensions and it's all exactly nominal except for one thing and that's an offset on the x-axis and that will be iterated through each run at the moment nothing's happening and that's because if we look in the um, looper tile you'll see I don't have any iterations set so it's not running any iterations but as soon as I start adding iterations it will start adding a new version of that little sphere that I have in here and it'll offset it according to the value that I've put into the x axis here. So that's all that's happening now we've, we've got our looper telling us to run through the iterations four times the memory tile down here which is a memory max tile so it's remembering the maximum value of what's going through is remembering how many tiles how many times we run through the tiles so that should all be familiar uh, to you from last week because it's basically the same thing the only difference being that we are now working in three dimensions rather than two. So instead of having just an X and a Y offset here, we've now got the Z offset as well. And we can now change any of those values to offset the iteration each time in one of those dimensions. At the moment, it's only offsetting it in the, the X dimension. So it's just offsetting a little bit in the X dimension. But if we put, start putting other values in here, we'll start offsetting in other dimensions. And the, the main one, of course, that's gonna be a big thing here is when we offset in the Z dimension, because now we're being able to offset how far something is away from the camera and how close it is to the camera. So once we start putting values in here, that's what will happen. Can't really see it there. Let me just um, move the X offset a bit. But now you can see, so we've got a, one object which is closer and one object which is further away as we go to the other end and they gradually go further and further away. Um, so what's happening now is that the iterations that are running through this system are now accumulating each time uh, at this point only the offsets in these dimensions. But of course, as we examined last week, this tile here, the one that sits in front of the looper, anything that's in here is going to start accumulating inside the iterations. So as long as you have a, a compile tree here, anything that you've got inside it, and just remembering that I'm toggling between what's in this little component by hitting the E key. So the E key will take us back and forwards into that, into that particular tile. Um, so let's just go inside there and see what happens when I add this to the accumulated iterations. So one thing you'll find pretty quickly when you start using these iterated systems, and particularly when you start getting into 3D fractals, is that you'll sort of stop using the sliders too much. And the reason for that is that any changes you make here can have like really big effects. Uh, and, and so it's better to have some control over what they do and you find that that's a lot easier to do if you use uh, numerical values. You can use the sliders, of course. It might be so bad when we're in this very simple system. Um, here you can see I've just offset the X, Y angle and now we've got a little bit of a curve. This is a truly 3D object that we have in here. So once we get back into um, Voyager, if we move the light around, you can see now it's behaving exactly like a 3D object. So it's just like those little 2D loopers, except now we're looping in 3D. Um, and we can, so of course we can now start putting values uh, inside the, um, the Z axis and the, um, well, these are, it's the Y, Z and the X, Z axis now because we're talking three dimensions. So they'll accumulate all the way through just as iterations do um, 
in any with any tiles you have in here. Uh, and you can see straight away that um, you know you're you're going to get something that's you know reasonably complex pretty quickly, particularly if you start adding other things in here. So just for the sake of argument, let's just pop in something else. So you can use any 3D space offsets in here. So anything that actually offsets the space. So we're talking about those three up there for sure. And then the mirrors, um, you probably won't want to hit the 3D repeats and tile because that'll get very ugly very quickly. But the mirrors and the distortions, these things here are all the valuable things that you may want to use here. So forget about any of this other stuff. This will not be relevant. Just these tiles here and particularly uh, the mirrors at the bottom here, not so much 3D reflect, that's a wholly different thing. Those things should probably not live there. They should probably live somewhere else because they don't really affect the space in the same way. Um, but you'll find once you've got those ones and those ones and you're using those, you've got many, 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 many different ways of manipulating this system. Let me just plug in this one. Okay, nothing happens. And that's because we're mirroring and we're mirroring in a in a uh, repeated way, but we've probably popped right off the side of the, the offsets. So we need to move our objects so that we can actually see them. Um, now, one thing that I should um, tell you here is because we are now in a very complex system, this is the situation where we start to kind of fiddle with things a lot um, before you'll start seeing things. Um, it's because things can, can iterate incredibly rapidly uh, and they can be sensible for one iteration and then really not very sensible for about two or three iterations after that. Um, you'll notice that I'm in the geographic clut here because um, this is the easiest way to actually see things. So when I had, when I was just back here before and I had that down there, you see, I don't, I can auto automatically tell, I'm not going to see anything because nothing is actually in the plane of the DF um, focus. I need to bring it up so that I can actually see some of those little yellowish dots, which tells me that we're going to be somewhere in the right plane uh, to see things. Um, the other thing you'll, you'll have noticed too, is that the thing is moving all around in the preview screen here. Uh, and, and that will of course be the case because you're moving things around in space and as you iterate them, they will move to one side or another side, up and down or back and forward. And you'll find that you probably have to kind of correct uh, quite often for things when you're, when you're doing this. Um, but the secret is little movements because you know, once once you start putting big movements in here, you're going to start finding all kinds of really bizarre things will, will start to happen. At the moment, I've just got a sphere in here and you can kind of see straight away what's happening. It's, it's actually taking the sphere and it's offsetting it a little bit because we've got an offset in up here. And it's also rotating it a little bit because we've got some rotation in here, but it's also being mirrored. Now, the thing, the thing to remember here is that the order of execution of these tiles will tell you how things are going to proceed. And that order of execution can be hugely different if the tiles are in different orders. So just remember that the way you put these things together uh, is gonna dictate how your system is gonna look. Um, so, excuse me, at the moment, what it's doing is it's just, so we're just gonna pop back out to the top of the tree. Oh, this tree is actually inside a, a compile tree um, for reasons I won't go into in any depth, but I've just been using it to copy and paste into other things, which I can do, of course, by putting it into a compile track and just take the whole lot and paste it somewhere else. But this is all you need. I mean, it doesn't have to be inside that compile tree. This is the actual system. Uh, and I'm just going to show you what happens if we just swap this out for something else. So I can, you know, now I can put in something like a sphere and a cone. Uh, it doesn't change it a lot. Let's try a box. And you'll see that the, the actual look of this thing changes according to whatever your solid is that you put in there. So remember that. And, and you don't, once again, you don't have to stick. This is just one solid we can have. We can add a different solid as you've seen in previous tutorials, adding two solids together and mixing them so that they're added or subtracted, uh, you know, using Boolean calculations can give you very different shapes in here. So remember that. Uh, and you can of course um, put, it, put a tile in above this to uh, move it in space. So we can just ro rotate that sphere around. So it's got different orientations, of course, as well. 
So remembering that anything that's in this tile here will be the thing that dictates what gets looped through the system. Anything below the looper is just going to affect the orientation of the, of the object itself. Uh, and you must have a memory tile if you're going to efficiently have looping happening here. Um, I'm just going to pop in here again. The thing you'll realize, of course, is that this, this can get very complicated because you can put as many things in here as you actually want to put in here, and each one of them will be iterated um, however many times you tell the system to iterate. And as you start to do that, you'll see you'll get lots of variations of how this works. Um, again, you know, I could tell you what to put in here, but really the best way of doing this is just to plug things in there and play with them and see what they do. It will become as complex as you really want it to be or as simple as you want it to be, but I really strongly sort of recommend that you start with um, a very simple, fundamental solid before you start playing around with things that are you know, too complex because even there you can see we're, all we have in here is a cube and this cube has now already gotten to be a very complex object. Um, and uh, it goes without saying is that you can also, um, if you want to get really, really um, scary, I have to just move this window so you can see this. We could also plug in, oh, go away. I can't, my zoom window is obscuring stuff here, so I can't see stuff. You can also pick one of these noises, remembering that what's going to happen here is the noise is going to be iterated in every generation. So if you put something in there, that noise is now going to start off at a certain level and each generation it's going to increase the level of the noise in some way. So you can see there we've got this very, very kind of um, noisy object. One of the best things to do when you have noise working is to set the amplitude right down low in these systems. Um, and it will have a lot less, oopsie, that's not low, that's not low at all, let's try 0.2, and it has a lot less effect on what actually happens as the noise iterates through the system. Of course, if you set it to zero, it'll have no effect at all. And we stick it at five, let's say, and the frequency of the noise will also have uh, uh, an effect on what happens as it goes through the iterations. So just remembering all of these little things you can plug in there, anything that is a space distortion can go in there and you can have a great deal of fun just seeing how this stuff will go. So we're back to our cube here. Let's just pop into Voyager. We're back to our cube and you can see quite clearly here what's going on. So the this one here is not, it's distorted. It's the first generation, it's distorted, but it's not as distorted as the second generation and it's not as distorted as third. And as we keep adding generations, uh, let's get back in here and let's just pop out of here. I'm gonna add some more generations in here. So we've got four at the moment. Let's just go up to six. Um, you'll see that it gets more and more distorted as we go. It's also now, because we have a um, rotational tile, it's looped its back self back again. It's going to rotate in a spiral. It's going to just keep on doing that. The more we go, so each iteration accumulates all of the things that came before it. And that's something to keep in mind. It's not just changing it as it goes, it's accumulating as it goes. So um, <clears throat> I think you can see there again, this, you can get very comp I've only changed a very few things in here. You can get very complicated very, very quickly in these kinds of systems. So it's often really good just to stay in kind of low iterative values for a while until you get kind of used to what's going on. You can see it very clearly. Uh, and once you, once you get a feel for that, then you can kind of switch it up and start playing with, you know, more complex things. So let me just, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to swap this out with one of the other, um, oopsie, not there, uh, with one of the other shape um, primitives here. Uh, so this is just a little uh, sphere, I think. It's, yep, it's a sphere. You can see the same thing's happened here. It's just gotten a little bit more plasticine as it goes, so it's getting more and more deformed. But what I could do here is I could swap it out with something like a tube, and you'll see this goes wild very quickly. So we now have a series of tubes, and they're, they're, they're just kind of iterating through the values. So let me just go back down to one, down to zero. That's our first one. 
Uh, in the 3D looper, I don't think I have the option to uh, switch off. Yeah, you can't do what you can do in the 2D loop, loopers where you can, um, you can actually change, you can switch it so you don't have the first iteration. Um, you, to be honest, I never use it anyway, uh, but it means that you can't have a, f a first solid with no effect of the uh, tile above it. It will always have some effect. Um, let me just switch our iterations up again. And they get wackier and wackier as you go. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind that you can, you can just switch out these things for all kinds of different um, objects and each one of them will iterate um, just the same object, but, but change. And you can, as I said before, you could put in a complex system here where you can add all kinds of objects uh, and they would then kind of start kind of accumulating. And I'll show you while we're doing this, I'll just show you one that I've got. Here's one that I uh, prepared earlier. Let me go open recent and see if I can find, I don't know where it is. So I'll have to get it out of my menu. Let's save that. Um, I'll go into. What am I doing I'm in the wrong place? No wonder. It would help if um, I actually knew how to use a Mac. Um, I think that's the one I want. Come on, sausage, there we go. Okay, so this is a fairly complex um, object. <clears throat> so it's gonna take a little bit of time to do, do its little render there. Let me just, there we go. But this is built essentially the way that I just showed you uh, there with, with multiple objects, but it's essentially exactly the same kind of idea. It's using some mirrors and it's using a couple of primitive objects and I've got a bit of noise modulating it in there as well. Let's have a look at the, Matic and the designer system for that, not by doing that, by adding this and going there. Okay, so here you can see that object. It's not so different from what, what we've been looking at, but if we look in here, you'll see I've got a whole bunch of distorts and offsets happening. Uh, and our primitive is actually a combination of two shapes and they are also modulated by noise to give them various kinds of attributes. Uh, and so that's what gives us this kind of quite, you, you start to get to this point where you start to see these very sort of organic looking creatures and things when you're working like this. Uh, and it's not surprising because in nature, these ideas of symmetry um, are very, very common. And so what you're doing is you're basically using the sorts of ideas that nature uh, has evolved to uh, to create shapes, you know, symmetry is a very easy thing to do genetically because it's a it's a very simple command in the gene structure. It basically just says do this, but do the do it over flipped on an opposite way, uh, and just as it is in genetic structures, it's a very similar in uh, in the way that designer works as well. It's just a very simple command to do that. Um, now I'll go back into our into our other uh, little gadget. Um, because the one thing I didn't talk about was the way the color is changing. Oh, I keep doing that. That's wrong. It's that one. Okay, so we didn't talk about this side of it, but as you saw in the in the 2D loopers last week, we can also cause the color to be changed as we go through an iteration. You can change the, the, the grading of the color. You can change many things about the color, but I'm just going to show you the simplest thing to do, and that is to change the color via a series of gradations. So let's just switch this up to five. Um, you can see here that in this particular system, what's going on is that um, it's just changing from one color of purple to a lighter shade of purple or vice versa. Um, but by making, and the way I've done that is, again, if you, you know, in our 3D object tutorials, the very simple ones, you will have seen how we add color to an object. And this is pretty much the same thing. So we've, we've taken a little uh, side branch, which as you know, doesn't have to be connected because it's just a color tile telling it that it needs to be a color. Um, I've selected a color for it to start with, which is just a pinky color, which can be anything. It doesn't matter what have you choose. Um, and then we've 
added a, a rotational color tile here or rotational tile, but it's, it's actually talking about color here. This is just a, it's a rotational tile. So you could use it for just the rotation of the object, but because it's got three in and three out, um, as we've seen before, it can manipulate the values of the RGB stream because it's just values. And in this case, this tile is a four in three out and it has one additional input and that input can be used to control the amount of the rotation if you've got the right value coming in. So what I've done here is I've taken this output from the uh, looper tile and this just puts out the iterative value and we've put it into this color tile uh, and then we've set some values here and according to whatever values we actually have here, um, the iteration of the colors will change through as we go through the, um, the, the, the looping system. So that gives you the ability to actually on each iteration change your color to a new one. If you set these to very wild values, the colors will start changing really radically. Um, let's see if I can make it change right off the scale. I could just do this, I guess. Uh, instead of gradations, it's really kind of jumping through the color rotations very, very fast. So you get quite large variations as you go through. And that can be quite useful too, because it, just changing the colors on each iteration can give you very widely different effects and can and make your object, um, you know, look uh, spectacularly different as you go. So if you set this system up just as, as I did there, the only thing you have to remember is, so it'll all be nominal. Every single value will be nominal, except for that top offset value, which you need to go to show that you've got something iterating. If you don't have it, if it's on a zero, you'll only have one dot. So, so even though it's actually running through seven iterations or five iterations here, it's actually doing them all on top of one another. So you don't see anything. So keep in mind that you must, change something here otherwise it's just going to iterate at the object over and over and over in the same place and you won't see it doesn't really matter what you change although the rotation won't have any effect because it also just rotated in space you have to have some level of of material uh, distance offset otherwise you know you won't get that separation of the objects so keep that in mind when you do that um, so that's kind of it really. Again, it's a simple explanation of how it works. There are a few ways you can actually use 3D loopers. This is probably the simplest way. So, you know, if you start on this system, you'll probably find many, many, many things to do. It's like hours and hours of, of, of absorbing um, play to try and find out things that can happen here. Um, and it doesn't take many extra components in here for you to start getting extremely complex objects. One thing you'll discover as you go through this system is that uh, depending on what you do, that you'll start to see things that look like fractals. And that again is no coincidence because essentially this is, this is a fractal command. And what we're doing is we're telling the equation to put its output back into its input uh, and keep on doing that. And that's what a fractal is. It's a, a, an equation that's being told to reference itself. Um, so, this, so, so even in this simple system, as you start to add things to it, particularly the mirrors and particularly kind of move something, rotate it and then offset it, you'll start seeing things that look a real lot like uh, some kinds of fractal objects. Uh, and that's, that's why that will happen. Uh, which makes it a great point to jump off and talk about 3D fractals. Um, but before I do that, uh, any questions about where we are? Is, is that, are you clear on what happens there? Yeah, I've got one question about the looper tile itself. Yes. If you can click on it. Um, can you just explain again the difference between iterations and count multiplier? Okay, count the, the, iterations, the iterations are the number of times that things pass through the tree. Yeah. So th that's pretty direct. So it basically says perform the equation once, pass it through, perform it again, pass it through, and it do that five times. Mm -hmm. so that's pretty simple. It just does however many times you tell it to do it here, that's how many times it'll do it. I mean, you can keep on plugging stuff away here until you've got like hundreds of iterations. Of course, every single time you do that, um, 
is going to be an, a, an additional amount of calculation in the system, as we talked about last week. So the systems will become slower the more times you ask it to iterate. So be aware of that. If you put in 50 iterations there, it's going to take a, long, a lot longer to calculate. It won't be a problem when you've got a very simple solid like this. It'll do it almost instantly. But as you start to add things to, to the um, commands, it will become more and more complex. So you can actually structure systems here that will take a long time to calculate. So just be aware of that. And that's why I say always start with you know, start with a few iterations so you can see what's going on and, and you don't get frustrated. But you'll notice that as you get more complex, that, that will happen. So the count multiplier is basically a kind of like, um, let me say, it, 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 it actually takes the iteration, but it adds some value to it. Um, it, it, it multiplies it by a factor. Now, you don't usually need to move it away from one. If you're doing this kind of iteration, it's probably fine just to leave it at one. But it's like adding a multiplication to it. So um, if I change it up here, what will happen? Let's try 1.2. It, it just kind of says, exaggerate it more, if you like. It's multiplying how much value comes out of this input and how much, um, how much it affects the value. Uh, there, there are various ways that this can be used, um, but they're kind of esoteric for our purposes now. Pl you know, the best way to, to, to find out is just to play with it a little bit, but basically just think of it like this. So if, if it says um, it's putting out a value of five and you add some count multiplier to it, it's basically saying uh, each time you do it, add five plus some, and that increases. So that's, that's all that is really. Um, you can use it, it's really good, as you get more complex, it's really good for doing things like changing um, the luminance values in Voyager and stuff, but it's a bit complex for, to go into just now, so I won't, I won't kind of go into it, it's a bit of a sidetrack. Um, we'll, we'll need to get to some point, we have a much more advanced lessons, but I'm trying not to make these too complica complicated for, for starting out. And the second part of, it, of a question, which is the same sort of idea, if you click on the compile tree, this one, yep, it's also got a recursion thing. Is yes, that the correct. Um, and to be honest, I don't know what will happen if I do this. Oh yeah, so it's adding the recursion. So, so that recursion value. So compile trees all have a recursion value, and you can make them. Re uh, I could take all this out without a looper, and we would have a certain level of recursion happening. So you can definitely do that as well. Um, probably don't do that here because you're going to be adding the values together and that'll probably make it like even more wacky. Uh, so I would kind of keep that simple. But if you look in, there's lots of the kind of, if you go into the um, um, example files and have a good look at those, you'll see there's lots of versions of the way you can use recursion uh, inside of these trees. The only thing you have to remember is that if you've got a, if you've got a tile like this and you want recursion, you must have memory as well. That's always the way. So anything, so looper tile is basically like its own recursive tile, has its own value. A compile tree allows recursion because that can be useful in certain cases. There are many ways you can, you can actually tell the tree to be recursive. There are, there are uh, like a half a dozen ways you can tell it to do it. Um, this is just a side effect of the way we've, we're using this particular system because we want to have all of this stuff inside here that we can play with. Uh, sometimes you don't need to have a looper for this recursion to be working and doing what you want it to do. It's just, um, it's just like we've added an extra thing that's given us an extra value that we don't really need in this particular case, but we could if we wanted. So that's all that does. I would say if you're doing this thing to start with, just keep this exactly there and lock it off so nothing changes and, and you won't get into trouble because it's again these i'm making these things so you can kind of simply understand what's going on here uh, and i can't emphasize enough that you can get these systems to be like so complex that it's almost impossible to tell what any particular part of it is doing um, by just looking at it so it's best to start with a very simple system understand what's going on in each part of that system uh, and before long you'll be making systems that are so complex that you'll come back to them in a week or so and go I don't know what the hell this is doing now because I can't remember uh, and that's frequently I'll look back at systems I've done and, and go 
you know, I have to now go and disassemble every single part of it to understand what I did, because they are very complex things. It's a lot of complex uh, calculation that's going on here. But so start there, start with that to, and, and see where you go from there. Okay, shall I jump into fractals? Yeah. This the um, big scary part now. So we're gonna look at a fractal system now. <clears throat> This is the simplest fractal system that you can kind of have. Uh, let's bring it up inside of Designer. Okay, so this is one object again, it's just that 3D sphere that we've seen before. Uh, and this is the system that is dictating what the fractal will do. Now, you'll see it's sort of familiar in many ways, it should be. We have an object in here and we have some coloring in here. So you know that you've got, if I took out this part of it, you just have a sphere with a white color. So we, we're quite familiar with that as a concept. Um, but we have some additional things in here. So first of all, we have a, a space scale tile. You can, for most purposes, you can leave this exactly the way that it kind of defaults. It's just there to give you some additional ways of handling uh, the way the space is scaled if you need to, because with fractals, sometimes the scaling goes out of whack. And remember, we've talked about this before about how in a, in a DF object, it has to be scaled correctly. Otherwise you start to get calculation errors and it starts to create problems and it can, can make your systems take a long time to render and they can look very ugly. Um, but if you stick with, if you stick with this simple system to start with, you probably won't run into many scaling errors just at the beginning. Um, there is a, this is just a sphere. So the thing that's in there is just a sphere. Uh, and you'll see there's a kind of a magic tile sitting above here and its recursions are set at a value. So we are now using this tile to create the recursions. If I plug it down to one, it doesn't make much difference. And that's because we're not doing much, I don't think. Uh, doesn't do anything. Oh, that's right, because no, we want it here. Okay, so <laughs> let's, uh, it's, a, it's a little more, more complicated because we're, we're actually now in a fractal and I keep forgetting they behave slightly differently. So if you go inside um, this tile here, you'll see there's a couple of things here. And these are, again, these are space transform algorithms rhythms, but they behave slightly differently to the way that um, our th standard 3D space transforms uh, operate. Here I've just got two of them. I could actually um, get rid of the Mandelbox transform and we just have one sphere. And that's because the Mandelbox transform is a fractal algorithm. It's a, it's a, it's a space transformation, but it's a fractal. And this is the real secret of uh, these kinds of systems where you're telling this tile to repeat itself and itself contains a fractal uh, mathematical instruction. These things get so complex so quickly that it's pretty hard to tell what's going to happen at any particular time. So bear with me as we go through here because things will change uh, quite a lot very quickly and I'll probably have to uh, play around a little bit because I won't actually know what sorts of things are going on at any particular time. So why are you not updating your preview here? There we go. Okay, so there are a group of things you can choose from here. Um, these are the algorithms that fuel these fractals. And if we pop this down, you can see you've got a bunch of different things and they'll all behave in different ways. These are all different kinds of fractal descriptions. And straight away, I think you'll be able to see that we can, if we loop these around enough times, we can probably get into serious trouble. Sometimes you can't actually see what's happening with the looping because um, things are looping outside of our field of view. Um, but I'm get, what I'm going to do here, so I'm just going to start inserting some things in here and show you. So you'll be familiar with this because this is basically 
talking to the object in the same way as the, the, the looping tile, the thing before the looping tile was talking to the object in the 3D looper. Similar kind of idea. So the more things you put in here, the more this is going to affect what happens to this object. So I'm just gonna plug a few values in here and I'm going to start playing with fractal values as well. It's making them smaller, but that's not helping us. So these things will have various kinds of effects according to how much you tweak these tiles, how much you change your rotation, and so forth. Let's put in a space offset. Similar kinds of things that you're seeing here from what you've seen before. You'll see things vanish very quickly here. And once you, once you get the hang of these tiles, you'll start to just use numerical entries because they start to become too um, hard to manage. I'm just playing around here now because we get to a point where it's pretty hard to actually tell what's going to happen without doing it. Trying to get something more complex going on here. Let's move our value up a bit more. And also, again, I would say don't don't get too much with this this fractal um, recursion thing early on. It's a little bit too difficult to tell what's going to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in another fractal uh, space transform. No, that one. And I'm going to put another fractal in here. So what we have happening is a fractal command that's being pushed through here and it's actually changing um, values and then it's pushing another fractal command at the bottom. And this is where we start to get quite complex systems happening. Once again, um, you know, I'm using the geographic um, clut here to look at things because it's just easier once you if you if you've got nothing here if it looks like it's uniform blue your scales are you know somewhere else and they're not working properly so um, you need to kind of make sure that you're in that kind of uniform uh, area um, so I'm tweaking now this is where we start to get into a lot of a lot of fun So let me bring up, in fact, just to save some time, what I'll do is I'll just go in here and I'll um, bring up another fractal, which um, this will show you something else that I need to talk about with fractals as well. Okay, so this is a kind of a more complex um, thing going on here. Here's our, um, Here's our basic fractal that we were looking at before. Inside our iterations, I've got a scale and offset at the top. It's not very complex, actually, this one. I thought it was more complex than that. Values are pretty, pretty low here. Um, but you're seeing that this is kind of like a much more uh, fractally looking thing. You can see that once you go um, past a certain, so I've got 21 recursions in there. Once you go past a certain point, uh, these things will kind of explode into richness. Um, I'm just going to, again, I need, just need to kind of, I, I haven't really prepped what is going to happen with any of this stuff. So I'm just trying to um, play around with it to show you. you can see how it's changing the complexity of the object quite a lot. Probably too much because it starts to get kind of too sort of bulky. Let me just bring my rotations back down a bit. I'll switch this back into the geographic again. You see how it's very, very, um, it's just hanging in there really. 
And sometimes when you get these uh, fractals and you're starting to play with these offsets and things, you'll start to see um, spaces and holes inside your, um, inside your object here. And that's really fun because you can stick your camera in the middle of the, of the object itself. This object doesn't have enough space in it to do that. But I could get there pretty easily, I think. I just have to tweak and figure out where it's going to go. You can see um, these things blow out really fast. So you have to actually kind of not push them too hard. It's, um, Oops. I want to do is to try and get in closer to it so that you can have a look at this. You can see it is a um, you know like a complex fractal object, but the the basic way of exploring these is to is to uh, swap out these tiles with other versions of whatever you can basically in here um, to see what kinds of effects that they will have. Uh, they will be radical effects. So you generally need to kind of get into this habit of setting things right back at their nominal values. Playing with, uh, I'm just going to move our camera back a little, I think. Um, Come up. One thing you can see um, here is that we have this object which has got a lot of internal structure and when you see those, that's really joyful um, because it means that you can put your camera in the middle of it. So I'm going to, it's, it's a very, very, kind of noisy and complex thing here. So we're getting, we're getting a lot of uh, noise in the actual object itself. Need to change it so that it's a little less noisy. But again, that is um, tweaking. Oh, <laughs> let's go out here. That's our object. But at this stage, I've got so many values in it, I probably just need to reset everything. That's all nominal. And then bring our camera outside the object. I've kind of gone a long way from where I was there. Um, I want a space transform, absolute scale, that's right. Sorry, there's a lot of playing around with these objects. It's kind of um, just par for the course when you're setting up fractals. Just trying to get it to do something interesting, but it usually takes a bit of tweaking. Let's, stick it. Let's try and climb in one in there. It's mildly more interesting. So 
So it's just a different kind of fractal. Still not that, that interesting, this one. I should have um, found a much more interesting one for you. I didn't think, so kind of gets mysterious when you do this stuff. I didn't think it would be that hard to actually bring up one that was quite interesting. Um, but it is harder than I thought. Rotations back. Fractals are very uh, tricky beasts. Yeah, it's not very good, this one. Let me just see if I can find you um, something that's more interesting. <sighs> Nothing out of Voyager 3 will work, that's for sure. Sorry about this, folks. I, I did think this would be a lot simpler. Mm. I'll just go back to my on the ramp. One of the things I was going to show you here, which is uh, quite uh, useful to know. So this is, um, this is a, a simple fractal. Um, and you can kind of see, I think, just from me kind of scrabbling around trying to get things to work, that this is really about spending a lot of time tweaking. Um, It's just an, a real experimental thing to do. And the values of things are really tiny and all that kind of stuff. But once you've got this system uh, set up, you'll find that there's a lot of um, potential in just kind of playing with it. So you can kind of see there what, what it looks like. But the thing I was gonna show you is um, one of the other really great things about fractal systems is that you can, um, actually use, you can just color them as you would color anything, but you can also take um, the color and you can cause the color to be iterated as you go through the fractal. At the moment, what's going on is that I'm using this tile. So this is, a, this is a, um, an RGB color tile, but what it's doing, and I don't think I've touched on this before, is that it's taking the, the values of the, um, the, the cluts up here and it's turning them into um, three uh, RGB values. So normally when we're in a 3D system, as you'll remember, uh, you'll only have, you don't have the abilities to choose from here, but this tile allows you to do that. It allows you to take whatever values you've got in here and then map them according to RGB, RGB values. Uh, even better than that, in this particular case, what it does uh, is it allows it to distribute it across the fractal. Uh, in each of the generations of the fractal. At the moment, you can see yellow and blue, but let's just, if we move the gradient offset a little bit, we should be able to kind of just change it across uh, the gradient. So it's just, it's where we're seeing parts of the gradient here. And with fractals, this is great because um, you can get some really great coloring according to the fractal progression. Uh, I really would love to expand this fractal out a bit. I'm just going to play with it a bit more. I can't for the life of me figure out why I can't kind of blow it apart a bit more. It is, it is always the way though with fractals. You're, it's all about just tweaky, 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 tweaky. See what I'm looking for is, see those holes there? I'm looking for those holes because as soon as we start seeing those holes, um, we can move our camera inside the fractal 
Oopsie, don't do that. Let's see that a bit here. Zoom in a bit here. Always another little tip with using fractals, make sure you switch keep on top off because it will tend to try and put you on the top of the fractal all the time. Sometimes you want to be inside the fractal, which is what I'm trying to do here. Now I'm sitting inside a space inside the fractal and you'll often find that this is where you start to get really beautiful um, fractal shapes and lovely kind of effects. So you see this fractal has got lots of holes in it and that's what I'm trying to do, put, put my camera in one of the holes. These values, you know, as I said before, these values um, can kind of blow you right out. So you really want to be in small values and you change things in very small increments with fractals. Make this 1.3. No, not enough holes. I like the holes. So you can see I'm I'm actually sitting inside the fractal and I'm I'm moving around to look in different directions. It's not the world's most interesting fractal, but I think you can see that once you start plugging stuff in here, you'll find that you know you can start to do some pretty cool things and get some pretty cool um, stuff happening. I'm just going to set this one back to normal. Again, the other thing to keep in mind here is that uh, when you're um, putting things in this stream, the order of execution will affect what happens. So where they sit. So, so I just swapped that rotational tile. This one's gone back to zero. In fact, I can take it out. I put a rotational tile above the um, space offset, the little, the, the linear offset. Uh, and now we're starting to see kind of things that start, that look interesting. So it can be as simple as something like that, where you, where your offset, tile is in the wrong order to your rotation tile and you're not getting the sorts of things that you want to see. So keep those, those kinds of things in mind. Uh, and let's just um, go back into our offset with the gradient here. And you can see how that color is now being distributed across the fractal in interesting ways. Just to go back a bit, where was that? You mentioned about the keep on top control. Oh, that's that's a Voyager thing. So <clears throat> keep on top. This is um this is often used when you're in Voyager landscapes, and it basically means that the camera won't go inside, uh, you know, a, a, a terrain or something. It will keep, always keep the camera uh, at the same level above the landscape. So it's kind of useful if you're doing exploring when you're, when you're going around inside a Voyager standard landscape. It just means that you, you can never lose your camera underground and stuff. Uh, and it'll always keep it on the top of the, the landscape. The, similarly, this one, this one here will push it down. So if your camera is up very high and you click on this, it'll put it down to the, to, to the landscape level. But when you're in a fractal, you probably don't want that because it will always, it will inevitably, if you're inside the fractal, you want to be able to see inside the fractal and it will inevitably try and put you on the top of the fractal. Um, so just, you know, if you find, oh, you know, everything's disappeared and I'm not where I was, it's probably because that switched on. So keep that in mind. Right. <clears throat> so um, I don't know that I have anything else to impart here other than, uh, again, this is an experimental thing. Uh, started off very simply and as you start putting different kinds of things in here you'll start finding that all you know it just starts to go wild um, you can you can put another fractal in here so it's it's possible to as long as you choose a space um, 
transform. Uh, okay, so it's stuck in a scale and offset, but you can put in, you know, something else here. The, these things will go wild, wild, wild. <laughs> um, so let's see what that does. Okay, well, that's not bad actually. So I put in, so I put in another, another kind of fractal. So what's happening here is we've got a fractal, it's got some rotation, it's got some offset, then it's got another fractal. Uh, and the more of these you do, the more complex it can become. And you can start to see the, uh, the value of, of these really extraordinary um, ways of manipulating space. And the thing to remember here too, is that we, we're still basically, our, our seed object is only a sphere. Let me just check, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, it's a tube here. Let's just make it a sphere. Doesn't make any difference very much. Uh, and that's because once you get to a certain point when you're using fractals, the number of iterations just kind of destroys the original um, shape of the object and it will really not make a lot of difference. Let me just see if I put this down to one or two. Yeah, so you can see the sphere structure there. So that's, that's only on one level of recursion. You can kind of see the sphere structure. So if we popped something else in here now, like a donut, probably see a little bit of that. But these have big profound changes when they're at, when they're at small numbers of iterations. So just keep that in mind. Um, tubes. The tubes are being rotated back inside themselves, so they don't have as much of a, an effect. Probably best to start off with a sphere when you're doing this kind of thing and then experiment. But the basic rule of thumb is if you, if you want, actually want to see your original shape, you need to have the recursions down very, very low. As soon as you start switching them up, they start to lose their shape and it becomes just all about the fractal. Uh, and likewise, you know, like that fractal was up at 21 iterations, probably doesn't even need to be there. And the number of iterations that you have running are going to affect how long your render will take. So it's actually quite useful, again, to start off pretty low. Uh, and then you can switch some more in and see whether you're seeing any effects. But really, what's going on here is not having a great deal effect it's changing the colors because of the way that the colors are being applied, but it's not really changing the look of the fractal very much at all, but it certainly will change the number of um, calculations that, that the software has to do. So it's probably best to keep them down low. Um, I'm just going to zoom out of this. This kind of looks kind of fairly simple and not very interesting, but it's got some nice um, aspects to it, this fractal. Um, you can light it with the sun, but, but one of the other, oh, I should explain a couple of other things too while I'm talking about fractals because this is kind of important. Um, one thing that you should remember is, let's just look in our um, DF objects thing. One thing uh, it, that it's always best to do is to have the shader on fractal opaque. You can have it on volumetric opaque as well. Doesn't, it won't make a great deal of difference, but, but it's just much more efficient on fractal opaque. In fact, that one actually does make a lot of difference. A lot of the time you won't see a lot of difference between the two of them, but the calculations are done more efficiently if it's on fractal opaque, so you'll find it'll, it'll shade faster and generally look better. Um, the other thing I was going to say was, oh, with the object scale of, of a fractal, you, you really want to have it quite high. So even though you can have it down at 10, uh, it's probably best to have it, I find, somewhere between, even 100 is a bit small. I'd, I'd probably put it up around 200 generally. Um, that will dictate the size of the fractal. Um, and more importantly, it's just better when you come to lighting it. Because if you want to start using um, uh, distance field lights, uh, which you can use inside a fractal, um, it's much better to have the fractal big so that the lights can be more easily manageable. You'll find if it's small that you can't actually control the lighting efficiently enough. Um, this, uh, I just made that really big then. It's essentially exactly the same. It's just now we're, we've actually now gone into um, a lot closer view of it. But it's not that much different. 
Uh, it may affect how the color is applied as well. I can't remember. What about things like occlusion? Would you use that sort of practice? Uh, generally speaking, uh, it depends, but no, because uh, it, it, will, it will add a render cost to it and you probably won't see that much effect. Mm. Um, it, it sort of depends on what you're trying to do, but I, I would say most of the time don't. Um, ambient occlusion is really something for landscapes and things like that, where it just really helps bed things together. Um, so I would say not to do that. Shadows you can use. Um, you'll find straight away if you put cast shadows on and you're uh, inside a fractal, though you'll, you'll possibly lose some of your sun um, because depending where the sun actually is shining from, uh, the fractal itself will occlude the the shadows uh, and also the other thing to keep in mind is when you're in a fractal the calculations for shadows will be very very great you can already see it's taking quite a long time to to update um, that's because it's trying to calculate lots and lots and lots of um, surfaces and so the shadows can take a lot of time to to render now, so, i suppose if you want to add in some atmosphere to give it a sort of a nice appearance yeah you can do you can of course use haze and stuff that's yeah, another yeah. reason it's another reason why it's actually quite good to have the um, uh, fractal quite big, because if it's too small, things like haze won't really have as much effect. But it also depends on factors like, you know, this is now a very big fractal, so the, the haze is not having as big an effect, um, because it, we're, it's like it's vast, it's actually kilometers big now. So, so to, to actually get more of an effect, you'd probably want to set it back down to 100. Um, these, whoopsie, where have we gone? Oh, right outside. Even there, it's not having a lot of effect. I'll waste that maybe because it's not light enough. There's our haze value. It's having some effect there. Still very big. Oh, I shouldn't move the fractal around, should move the camera around. Anyway, you can play with those kinds of things, but yeah, haze and all of that stuff will work. So will, um, of course, will um, all of the, um, oh, also the other thing you'll find, you just saw then, you can get huge variations from according to where you are in the fractal. Uh, so sometimes a, a very boring looking fractal like this on the face of it, has beautiful and interesting things inside it, but you'll have to go and explore. They're, they're like building these kind of vast landscapes. Uh, and what you see here is just a slice of what the fractal is. So moving your camera up and down is often very valuable. You'll find um, you'll use the um, places quite a lot when you're working in fractals. If you, if we, we're just, I'm just moving my elevation down now. So you'll find that there are lots of interesting places inside fractals. Um, so it's, it's really well worth kind of having an explore, even if it doesn't, this one doesn't look like much chop, to be honest. I didn't think it would be that interesting, but it actually has some pretty cool spaces in it. So, you know, these are, this is always worth exploring, even the simplest ones. This is very simple as fractals go. I haven't really done a lot in this one. Um, but you'll find that for, out for yourself as soon as you start to explore, you'll, you'll find that there's kind of a lot of very interesting stuff in there. Um, what's the other thing I was just about to say and I completely forgot? Oh, you can also use uh, your specularity tools and so forth. So um, you can make your fractal shiny. Um, yeah, considerable render costs so if it's got so many surfaces to reflect that. specularity not so much um specularity will kind of work um nicely uh, on fractals um it kind of depends on a lot of factors though this should look shiny but I, i'm just in the wrong place to actually see it it has got a bit of shine to it hmm. so we knock down the haze a bit it might work better yeah it has got a bit of shine. you can also apply um um reflection to it as well uh this will that will actually cause you some some render cost though yeah. um speculation specular color there i wouldn't even bother with 
you, know, you can't really see it, but it does have specula specularity on it. Another thing too, of course, with fractals is that um, a lot of the time they can be very complex and you're not gonna see the true uh, value of the, uh, of the fractal until you render it. Um, so you find yourself doing a lot of uh, rendering when it, when it comes to fractals, just to see things that you wouldn't possibly have seen before. Are there any recommended render settings you would utilize to, to, to produce a render? Um, no, I, I mean, you know, I, to start with, while you're playing, to start with, keep your reflections um, stuff down, keep your color down, uh, don't have your shadows on, um, you know, the, all of those kind of things. Really, speculation does, specularity doesn't really matter. Um, shadows, and I keep those off for a while. You can use shadows in fractals, and I often do, but just keep in mind that once you switch shadows on and you're in, um, you know, best mode, it's going to be a fairly slow render. Uh, they can be quite complex. On the other hand, if, you know, if you design a fractal well, um, it's one of the things that you can quite comfortably render animation on Voyager with. So you've probably seen the animation I did where we fly around inside the fractal, the um, uh, ossuary, that small animation I did. Well, that was all done, that was all rendered at 1080. Uh, and the renders are, it was for an overnight, um, for an overnight render, I was getting something like 30 seconds at 1080 uh, and on, a, on better. So they will render quite fast, uh, you know, a lot of the time. That's, that was with no shadows on, of course. Um, and that was, you know, it's a pretty well designed fractal, that one. So, you know, it, ha it has, a lot of, uh, has a lot of efficiency in it. But you can actually, if, you, if you're just a little bit judicious with fractals, you can actually do an awful lot of um, uh, animation work with them. So it's well worth experiencing that because it's quite a lot fun to see something at high definition being rendered out of Voyager. Because usually once you get into landscapes and you put in a few clouds and stuff like that, animation in Voyager is so slow. Um, you, you just don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, I think that's about the strength of it, really. Uh, again, uh, you need to take a screen snap of that, take a screen snap of the inside of that, um, play with the uh, with all of the bits and pieces, and, and you'll start finding um, that it's just a wealth of exploration. And there is, again, it's one of those things, it, I can explain to you how to do certain things, but a lot of it is just finding stuff. Uh, and and it's half the fun of it as well. So, um, you know, I highly recommend you play with them and see what you can come up with. And you can stick as many things in here as you like, of course. You can have like multiple fractals happening inside here. Um, and that can get very bizarre. And the order that you have them, you'll, you'll come up with things that no one's ever seen before because um, there's just no way of predicting how this stuff is gonna render you just play with it and sometimes you'll come up with an incredibly efficient thing. The thing, I would say one big tip though, keep an eye on this geographic clut here. Um, and it should always look these shades of um, blue and pale green and yellow. And you should always see some of these yellow, kind of little yellow beigey spot, spots in it. If you start seeing other colors aside from those colors, your scaling is probably wrong. Uh, and there are ways of fixing the scaling. And this tile that we put at the top here is one way. You can actually bring, bring your scaling back by, you know, just changing it down. Usually what we do is, is people overscale. And so you see all this kind of bizarre clipping. Let's see if I can do it for you. I can't do it. It's, uh, you know, I haven't even set it up badly enough to do it. Um, but if you start to see weird colors going on, um, it, it probably means that, you know, you've, you've kind of overscaled it somewhere or other. You can also scale it at the other end. Um, but again, you have to be careful of, of how you scale things. It's, it's probably best not to scale things at all if you can avoid, avoid it. But you will find that when you're working in fractals, the scaling problems happen can happen pretty quickly because you're basically telling it to do things that are, um, you know, it's iteration again, scaling, can be iterated. So if you start with a small scaling problem uh, and then you iterate it a few times, of course, it's turned now into a huge scaling problem. Um, but, but try and, 
the, if you start to see scaling problems, the, the way to deal with that is first of all, whack your, your recursions right down. So bring them right back and see if that helps uh, because you may just be iterating too far and then have a look at your space scaling on either end. So the scaling here will affect it too. Um, but I think, you know, talking about scaling problems is probably a whole, whole tutorial in itself. Uh, and I'd have to try and make some really sensible scaling problems so I can actually show you what I mean. Cause, cause usually most of the time you don't even see them until they're a problem. And then you've got to go, why, why have I done, why has this happened? So that's about it. Any other questions at this point? Cause I think, I think what you should do now is as you have been doing, uh, go into the into some of these systems and start playing and then you'll no doubt have questions but I saw that both both of you had um, uh, some very good kind of results from our last tutorial where you you dived in and you found some cool things straight away so I think you both have kind of understood very clearly how how much uh, you can do with these systems and how powerful they can be mm -hmm. yeah that was really quite impressive what you can do with that simple system that you gave us last time yeah and these are even more so because now now we're getting into the like the three dimensions uh and you know you can just i don't know i'm i i still play with these things all the time because i i come up with ideas you know what what happens if i had two fractal systems and they were both different systems and then i combined them together with a mixer what would happen could I kind of could I negatively mix one with the other? So one fractal took a piece out of the other fractal. And what would that do? Well, that turns out to be like an amazing thing. Uh, and so you can, you know, I could spend, I've just started exploring that kind of idea, but you can imagine that starts to become, oh my God, there's a whole new thing because now each of the fractals has a contributive part to, to play. Uh, and that can, you know, the two surfaces interfacing can cause all kinds of interesting uh, effects as well. Um, then you get into the situation of, well, I have one object, which is a fractal, uh, and it's a simple fractal. Can I make that the seed object for another fractal? Well, yes, of course you can do that as well. Um, so there's just a billion things you could do with these kinds of systems. It's just time. <laughs> All right, so I think um, we'll, we'll call that one quits there. I, I hope that's kind of enough. I'm sorry about the kind of exp exploration bit in the middle there, uh, but that, as you will see pretty quickly when you get into fractals, that's par for the course. You, you know, you, you can never predict what's gonna happen, particularly once you, you, know, you start going wild and you, you say, oh, what happens if I stick some mirrors in there now? Can I, can I put a 3D mirror in that stream? Oh, well, of course you can do that too. Uh, yeah. There's all kinds of stuff you can now get into once you once you start getting into these things. So um, it's best to start very simply, uh, and and you'll you'll quickly understand how complex and how much fun they can be. <laughs>